The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, a painting special. Is this time-honoured medium the art form best suited to exploring the complexity of our age? As a huge survey of contemporary painting opens at the Hayward Gallery in London, I look at the thriving and diverse contemporary painting scene in the UK and explore the Hayward director Ralph Rugoff's suggestion that this ancient medium, quote, seems like the best technology there could possibly be for reflecting on what it's like to live in a culture where image is the primary currency it is. I talked to two emerging artists in that show, Mohamed Sami and Vivian Zhang, both born outside the UK but working in London. And I talked to Deron Langberg, a Brooklyn-based painter, about his latest work reflecting on queer desire and identity and landscape as a space of mourning. Then I talked to the art advisor Lisa Schiff about paintings and the market. And in this episode's Work of the Week, we explore a newly restored canvas by one of the greatest of all painters, Johannes Vermeer, girl reading a letter at an open window from around 1657 to 59. It's just been unveiled in its full glory for the first time in centuries at Dresden's Gemälde Galleria Alta Meister, fully revealing a hidden image of Cupid painted by Vermeer but painted over by someone else. And we hear about new research on that painting. Before all that, our sister podcast, A Brush With, returns next week with a new series of four episodes. In A Brush With, I talk to leading artists in depth about the influences and cultural experiences that have helped define their life and work. The first of the weekly episodes out next Wednesday, the 15th of September, is A Brush With, Philippe Perreno. Do subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to hear that and to explore the archive of more than 20 conversations with artists from Ronnie Horn to Judy Meritu, Doho Sa and Glenn Ligon. Now, the Hayward Gallery's exhibition Mixing It Up features 31 painters currently working in the UK and attempts to document a moment in which, as the Hayward's director Ralph Rugoff contends, the UK painting scene is among the most thriving and dynamic in the world, and the medium is most acutely addressing the complexities of the image-saturated world in which we live. I went to the Hayward to speak to two artists who reflect the diversity of the show in terms of the backgrounds of the artists and the form of their work, Baghdad-born Mohamed Sami and Beijing-born Vivian Zhang. But before that, here are some thoughts from Rugoff about why he's putting on a big painting survey now. This is a show that focuses on artists who live and work in the UK. And in the last few years, a really significant number of younger artists have emerged, I think, as amazing painters. And so that, along with the fact that there already was a kind of more mature group who developed around a couple of bright lights who became very well known. People like Chris Afili and Peter Doig, who've had retrospectives at the Tate. But a lot of the people in that other group hadn't been given major museum treatment. And I think the other thing was just noticing, especially from looking at the younger artists, but then looking back at artists who were really interested in exploiting paintings, amazing kind of multiplicity or heterogeneousness or just... The fact that, you know, on a single canvas, you can combine allusions to different genres, traditions. You can have the paint behave in different ways. You can link parts of the canvas through how you're using color or form and set up connections that are very hard to do in a photograph or even in sculpture. Basically, you have this incredible freedom. And these are artists who I think for the most part are all looking at painting as an act of assembling references and bringing things from different territories and time periods. So there's very much a sense of painting as a platform for these kinds of conversations, and even for kind of speculative thinking, almost like the way fiction mirrors the lives we lead. So that painting is not about depiction, it's about generating these kinds of associations and chains of reference that allow you to think and speculate yourself. So I'm here with Mohammed Sami in the Haywood, in front, surrounded, in fact, by his paintings. And uh, Mohammed, I wanted to ask you to begin with about what 
paint permits you to do in terms of constructing narratives? Because it seems to me there's a lot of, there are shadows, potent shadows in your work, for instance. There are elements of perhaps a little bit of humour, but also the, the subject matter is very dark. So tell us about why paint is the best material for transmitting that language. Well, this is quite a tricky question because, you know, when we talk about this medium, I think we need like many hours or if not many days, especially when it comes to their memory or conflict or past, you know. So, but uh, to define the process briefly, I think painting is the, the only perfect medium that has ability to, to depict the absence or something it's not present in the painting, something it's, uh, it's entirely absent. My work is about memory, but it's not a typical memory. It's um, about uh, the forgetness more than just remembering. So um, I think the best narrative for the painting is to exclude the painting from figures. And then, of course, this is the everyday objects, landscape, the memory masquerading as everyday objects and the landscapes and the interior and external spaces. That's why and um, the memories turn to be curious in my work and, and these objects and uh, light and shadow turn to be curious and uh, it's not it's ambiguous in other words and also to uh, to invite the viewer to land on their conclusion yeah that, i mean that, ralph rugoff when talking about this exhibition has talked about the sort of rich ambiguity mm. in the works of the artists he selected mm. and that it seems to me that's really potent in your work when we're looking at i'm looking at right now at a shadow of a plant on a door mm. but it looks like a spider for instance yes and so uh, there's all sorts of associations that's conjured by these interior spaces with mm. these potent shadows. Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, I lived most of my life in Iraq and I've witnessed like many wars in Iraq. So, and then I left the country in 2007, which has mean there's a gap between now and the past. And uh, what you see in the painting is belated response to the past, to the conflict. So what we see is apocrypha, of past, and that's why we don't know if this a real thing that I have seen it, or this is maybe just the effect of memory that represents maybe in the shadow of a spider. So what we see today, it seems evident artwork. So that, like when we see the images, we are doubt if this really happened, if this really exists, this object, or what I, what I call it, one of the painting, electric chair. Is it really electric chair? Because it seems it's not. It seems very beautiful and laid chair with the gold, but also it's a reference for Saddam Hussein chair, and this is what led him to the electric chair. So that's why in these works, what we see is just the effect of some previous events that happened or maybe it's not happened at all. I wanted to talk about the capacity that your works have for a kind of fluency of paint. That, that It seems to me that despite that weighty subject matter, mm. we are looking at that electric chair, as the work's called now, and that in the detailing on, on this throne, there is wonderful expressive paint. Mm. And it seems to me that that's in all your work, that, that, that you don't, you're not illustrating, you're allowing the paint at points to sort of take over in that process mm. of memory. Yes, this is very important. And that's why, I mean, the, the medium painting is, is very important to the subject matter. What, what we see today, it's what, and what I call it, it's a democratic system of interrelationship between these mediums, the variety or the diversity of working. For example, using the knife palette, using uh, the spray painting. And this, the diversity or the variety of working, it's, it's sort of working together and collaboration. It's not sort of force. The purpose of using this rendering is to break down the story. You know, it's not about outraging anymore. And it's not about propaganda, as I've learned from al Ba'ath regime when I was very young. So that's why using this diversity of working is to invite you to look at the painting first and to appreciate the painting first. Then voluntarily, you will go to the subject matter and you will wondering around, like, what this about, what this about. And, and that's what, what I call it about the usefulness about the ambiguity is not... A delusive, it's not to delude the viewers from the main point of the painting or to make puzzles in the work, rather than invite them to explore more about the past and about the history. It's something quite the opposite of media, like what we see every day, and also the opposite of, of the work that is, comes from Middle East that passed the viewer a mild version of a trauma. You know, when you see conflict, explosions, and body corpse and blood. So that's why I think this is the only way is to tell the story or to provide a different narrative for the past and conflict. One thing I'm 
interested in asking you is, is you know, you're in a, a, a big show about painting. Mm. What does it mean to you to be shown alongside other painters? Is, is there an element of, you know, do, do you like to be categorised among other painters? Do you, see your, do you see painting as sufficiently kind of individual as a medium that you want to be shown alongside other painters? Uh, this is also um, a very good question because, of course, this is not any painting exhibition. It is quite very unique, you know. You have around 31 artists, five painting everyone. So when you walk around, like, this image is, it will hit you. There's loads of figures, there's loads of different narrative, you know, conflict, past, memory, whatever, present. And that's why it's difficult for me to value. Of course, I, I mean, I'm aiming my painting to compete other mediums you know, to, to compete in installations because um, I've, I've, I've taught art in Goldsmith College and this was the point at Goldsmith is to put your painting beside any installation or video art. So that's why to be in an exhibition like that, it's, um, it's challenging. But I can't define what is the challenging exactly, in particular, is it good or bad. In overall, because I'm talking from a perspective of artists, like if you ask a viewer, of course, they will give you other insight, you know. So the, the other insight is, could be like that. It's actually the exhibitions give you a brief about the art scene in painting in UK. So if you want to see what happened outside, something away off on Instagram or Facebook or social media, something very particular here in this exhibition, you can see it everywhere. Because I'm personally, I'm not a big fan of visiting exhibitions. You know, I, every year I visit just to exhibition, imagine or not, uh, during my residency in London. So this is maybe the first exhibition after the pandemic I visited. But what I've seen here is something very different of Instagram because I, be I believe Instagram is toxic, the painting, and destroyed painting, all what you see. One the image and all what you see, it's hit off likes and comments. But here you are alone physically front of this piece, you know, with this quietness and with this atmosphere. So that's why, of course, it tastes different when you came to Haywood Gallery to see this exhibition. It's fascinating what you say about Instagram because that's one of the things that Ralph again stresses in his essay is, is that this, this is the opposite of the swipeable mm. one-liner image, that, that in some way this is about, we've heard a lot about slow looking in terms of painting. Yes. And, and, and that seems to be absolutely one of the points of the show. Yeah, what, what I think most of the painting here, what we try to achieve here is to make a timeless painting that you not see at one time and that's it. You know, Painting that it's work anytime, everywhere, in spite of who you are, you know, so if you were from Iraq or if you were from Britain, like your painting is supposed to be work everywhere. While in Instagram, like there's something about the authority, you hit the name and then there's something coming, images, and you associate with, with the numbers. Unfortunately, the, the, the paintings in the digital media turn to be a numbers because you see comments here. As I mentioned before, you are going to, uh, to stand with your own comments with then you, you know, that's why I need to come several times to define what I have seen. It's not easy to take just one look and then you say, yeah, this is my favorite piece or this is my favorite artist. No, this absolutely doesn't work like that. You need at least a few times and maybe you will understand what you have seen after several months or maybe after one year. Mohammed, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Cheers. Vivian, you came to the UK via a, a sort of complex journey which began in Beijing and then went through Kenya and then to Thailand. Is, is that significant in terms of your work? Definitely. I think um, through these experiences I've encountered a lot of different cultures and different visual stimuli and I think they definitely feed into my work um, and sometimes my work is about that. Can you say in which ways you translate that into sort of painted form? Because looking at your work, I suppose one, one might immediately think these are abstract paintings, but obviously it's when you go up close that you see something beyond pure abstraction, right? I like to quote a curator, actually. She once said that I create an ecology of motifs. So I think... I gather motifs and visual images and references from all these experiences and even, you know, new experiences now. Um, and then I build my paintings by assembling all of them in my work. So there isn't really one distinct narrative in my work. Um, and it's about more about the coming together of 
different experiences and things I've seen and then making sense through that kind of assemblage or collage of different things. There is very much the collage quality to your work, isn't there? I mean, yeah. and, and, and do you look at the history of collage as much as you would to the history of painting? Oh, I love Hannah Hawke's work. Like, collage definitely, I think, um, is a big part of history that actually influences many artists today. But collage, I'd like to think of it also in terms of technology today, because I feel like the way that, you know, for example, browser window sits on top of one another is a bit like collage. So there is that analogy to collage as well with everything we're encountering on a daily basis today. You linked that to your, to your identity earlier on, and I know that you, in, in some ways you feel like through this process of creating work, you're thinking through your identity in some way yeah for sure I think I've always had a difficult relationship with the places I've been to because I feel like I am still an outsider even though you know they actually uh, make up a big part of my identity Um, so I think through looking at uh, motifs and images and uh, from past experiences and then you know uh, encountering them again in my work in the studio it, it helps me make sense of my relationship to them as well I'd like to ask a bit more about the sort of digital aspects because it's, it's interesting to me that in one quote in the catalogue Ralph Rugoff says that the work in the show is kind of an antidote to the kind of one-liner swipeable imagery mm. That's absolutely true of your work too. But your work, as you say, is is within the frame of reference of those kind of swipeable digital sure, images, right? Sure. I think when I talk about my work, I always want to say that I am not trying to describe a digital field, but my work and myself, we are symptomatic of digital age. So I think the way that my work looks digital is because I am a person of this generation and we are always influenced by what we see, what's what's around us. Um, and the fact that people are able to see the works in person is really great because then you can see the mistakes, the smudges, the you know the glitches in, in the paint or you know the imperfection. Um, and that's really a commentary also on the digital because you know often we are actually enhancing mistakes, you know, say in algorithms or or in yeah in technology in general. Yeah. I'd like to ask you about what it's like to be in a painting show like this, because here we are, we're in the space, and I'm now looking at Daniel Sintzel's paintings, Mm. which are hanging opposite yours. I love his work. Right, well, so tell me what it's like, Mm. because obviously you you don't really have a say in terms of where your work's shown Mm. in this this exhibition, do you? So tell me about that process of seeing your work. Does it make you reflect on your own work in different ways? Oh, absolutely. I think, I mean... We don't have a say, but Ralph, when he was curating the show, he has been always communicating with us. Um, and so I knew from early on that I would be placed with Daniel. And I think, you know, it, it is a consensus. If I had a clear objection, you know, if I think it's a really weird pairing, I think there would be a discussion. But I just loved how it naturally came together because he plays with illusion, trompe l'oeil, and, um, you know, space a lot. And that's something I think about in my work. So I think... We do, you know, all of us uh, working in the arts, we do have an understanding of what communicates better. Um, You know, especially if you have a deeper understanding of painting, I think there is a natural path to which works talk better with um, which other works. Yeah. And of course, there's that sense in which you're you're gathered among 30 other artists. Mm -hmm. And while there's no sense in which this this is defining a movement or anything Mm -hmm. else, is it significant to you to be placed in a kind of dialogue about painting? Does that feel like a a natural place to be or does it feel in any way forced? Very natural because I think there's no one direction for painting or art today. Um, I think we are in an age where artists are looking at many different things and we are so much more diverse now and I think a painting show like this where you can see so many different styles and uh, many different focuses exactly pinpoints to this and there's no one direction and this might be a problem of our age but I don't you know I think it's just a condition of our age there's no you know one cause that all artists are are going for and I think uh, you know, to be included in this show, I really echo uh, with the theme, which is about, you know, uh, artwork is much more open-ended. For example, the philosopher Umberto Eco, he says, you know, the work of ours, a place is to create an open network, it's not to 
be didactic and pinpoint just one narrative, really. Do you feel part of an actual community in the sense that, you know, are you on a daily basis talking to other painters mm. and, and engaging with painters on the sort of matters at hand? Yeah, I actually feel like I belong to many communities because the art world is made up of many communities which cross over. So I feel like my network is in the UK. You know, I have many more artist friends in the UK. But at the same time, I am also a part of the Chinese community in the UK. And there is a small group of Chinese or Asian artists working in the UK. But I'm also slowly becoming more a part of the community back in China as well, because my work is now traveling back to China, which is quite interesting. Um, so yeah, for sure, I think the communities in London are very inclusive, and you can find different communities. You can almost also belong to many different communities. It's not like borders are drawn. It's more like borders are opened up. Vivian, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Mixing it up, painting today is at the Hayward Gallery in London until the 12th of December. And if you're quick, you can see Vivian Zhang's exhibition Lorem Ipsum at the Long March Space in Beijing. It closes this Sunday, the 12th of September. Coming up, I talk to the US painter Daron Langberg and I talk to the art advisor Lisa Schiff about paintings and collectors. And we look at that transformed painting by Vermeer. But first, here are a few of the top stories on our website this week. A contested memorial of the Confederate General Robert E. Lee in Richmond, Virginia was removed from its pedestal on Wednesday before a jubilant crowd. As Gabriella Angeletti reports, the statue, which has towered over the city's historic Monument Avenue since 1890, is the last Confederate memorial to be removed from the area since last summer when controversial works were toppled or vandalised across the country at the height of the Black Lives Matter protests. Virginia's governor, Ralph Northam, who live-streamed the sculpture's removal on his social media accounts, said that the statue represents a shameful 400-year history of racial injustice in America and that taking it down marks a progressive step for this historically conservative state which was once the capital of the Confederate government. In the face of mounting pressure from nervous exhibitors and last week's advice to US citizens not to travel to Switzerland, Art Basel has sent another letter of reassurance and concessions to its exhibitors. As Anna Brady writes, the letter outlines two substantial one-off initiatives that Art Basel's director Mark Spiegler says are extraordinary measures for extraordinary times. First, Art Basel's pledge to foot the bill for any hotel quarantine, and second, it will establish a 1.5 million Swiss franc solidarity relief fund that will be apportioned out to any galleries disappointed with their sales at the fair. And finally, patients suffering from stress in Brussels may find themselves under doctor's orders to visit museums in a three-month pilot project inspired by a similar programme in Canada. As Catherine Hickley writes, Delphine Huber, the city's head of culture and tourism, devised the project in partnership with the Brugman Hospital in Brussels. Doctors at the Brugman can prescribe museum visits to individual patients and the hospital's stress clinic will also organise collective visits for inpatients receiving therapeutic treatment. You can read all these stories and much more on our iOS app, which you can get from the App Store, and our new Android app, which you can find on Google Play. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. From a Tang Dynasty silver rhinoceros dish to Huang Huali furniture and Japanese metalwork, the six distinct sales of Asian Art Week, starting on the 14th of September, bring together innumerable eclectic works and objects from across this vast continent. Other highlights include paintings by the South Asian modernist Narayan Sridhar Bendra and 16th century Tibetan masters, rare woodblock prints by Utagawa Hiroshige and Katsushika Hokusai, and a Qinglong period Kusa dragon robe. Discover more at Christie's.com. Welcome back. Now, the Israel-born, Brooklyn-based painter Daron Langberg is among the most highly regarded artists in a new generation of figurative painters in the US. He's just opened Give Me Love, his first UK solo show at Victoria Miro in London. Langberg's best known for his explicit close-up images of queer love, and these feature in the show alongside touching, intimate images of Langberg and his husband, and a group of landscapes made as he grieved his sister, who recently died, and featuring his siblings in the Menashe Mountains in Israel, where the family grew up. I went to the Victoria Miro Gallery to talk to him. 
Daron, you've got your first solo show in London here at Victoria Miro. I wanted to ask you to begin with, when you come to put an exhibition together, it's your first showing. How conscious are you that it needs to be some kind of manifesto for your work or that it has to have a certain quality to it that, that defines what you do? It's funny, this is my third solo show. And I feel like for the first time, this process really felt like the pieces are fully communicating with one another. And it feels like a body of work that is not just kind of a collection of what I've done in the last year, but really uh, a more coherent thought. Uh, so that was really kind of an exciting process um, to go through in the last year and, and change that I've worked on it. Um, the, the paintings in the show are quite broad ranging. And so even though there's a, a small body of very large works, um, but they include landscapes, they include a, an image of, a, of your husband in the bath, and they include, um, you know, very close up, intimate scenes, sexual scenes. Can you say something about those distinctive characters in your, in your work? I think that throughout my practice, the sexual content has been kind of a constant, maybe even the core of my practice and kind of something that subject matter wise relates most to queerness. And I think that as my practice grew, I really was thinking about how how a queer subjectivity can talk about different subject matter, uh, how it could um, address family, address, you know, spaces like home, uh, ideas about mortality, um, ideas about relationships, love. So trying to kind of bring very different subject matter together through maybe pain handling or color and kind of have a sense of empathy through the touch of the work that um, connects it all. That's really interesting. Talk, tell me about that sense of empathy because they're really tender portraits. There's a portrait, uh, I talked about the image in the bath for, for one, that's you looking at your husband in your bath. And then there's also an image of the two of you, which is a, a very gentle um, and, and actually a very lightly painted uh, image. So tell me about those, the, the, you know, that, that, that tenderness that you're talking about and empathy. I think it's funny with the, the last painting um, of the show, which is the two of us together, which is very lightly painted, like you said. And I think for years, I wanted to make a painting that feels so lightly touched. Um, and it was probably, I, it came together in maybe two or three painting sessions. So for me, it was kind of this like revelation, almost like a gift in the end of this painting process. And I think that the empathic relationship in the work really comes from my close relationship to the subject matter. So obviously with, with my husband or painting my home or my siblings. And I think it's, it's kind of this digging in words that allows people to access these feelings that they also have. Uh, so I think that's perhaps how it operates from a viewer perspective or what I would project it does. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that sense of painterly touch, do you equivocate that to the touch of a body so in other words are you trying to do with your brush in a way caressing that canvas in the way that you caress a body absolutely I think that the kind of the imprint of my body and having marks that are really fast really broad and marks that are kind of smaller or lightly touched kind of the, just a variety of textures and gestures in the work speak to my body in the process of making like you're saying um, and I think that brings the, the viewer so much closer to the process, having that um, so evident on the surface. One of the things about, about looking at your work is that, of course, you're engaging with the history of painting and, and genre and the nude, the landscape, etc. It's interesting to me that you, I know that you've said that it's not necessarily the imagery in your work that makes it radical or in some way political or social. It's the context in which the work is shown, or the, the, the political environment in which it's shown. Can you say something about that? Totally. I think this is, uh, the politics of the work is really something that I've been thinking about for such a long time, because I think that my initial impulse, um, you know, like loving people like Lucian Freud growing up or a Victor Arica, is that personal connection, that the painting as an object serves as almost a conduit between the viewer and myself. And when I kind of approached to do that, even when I was a student in undergrad, these images uh, were of queer relationships, queer sexual relationships. So I think the politics was almost presented as something that I had to kind of grapple with uh, in the aftermath of really just this very straightforward, pantry impulse of sharing something that's very intimate to me. Um, so I think it really took me a, a very long time to understand in terms of like the queer politics, how it um, engages within the work, how it operates, what does it mean to make paintings that represent queer relationships, how a painting of my siblings could be 
part of a queer narrative or um, a conversation about queerness. So it's been really interesting to kind of like just follow my, my desires and follow my impulses and, and see how the politics develops within the work. There's a clear aspect of your work, which is this sort of zooming in and out of focus within the body of the work. So there are quite finely painted elements in terms of like quite quite closely realized depictions of faces and parts of bodies and and um, bits of landscape and things like that but then there are distinct moments in the canvas where it feels like abstraction it, that push and pull it seems to me is a, a really crucial balance in the work can you say something about what, what about how you achieve it and is it a struggle totally I mean I think that I don't really see the work as having abstract components per se it's more like abstracted so they're all part of kind of a coherent idea of an image or a space it's just that some parts are more realized than others. And I think it just allows the viewers to move through the piece more freely, kind of allows me to emphasize different elements that I feel like are important for the emotional resonance of the work. And what I love about painting, there's such an excitement of letting something dissolve and then like refinding it and um, have it be kind of this like fluid process that's communicated through paint. One of the works, as we said, was Your Husband in the Bath. It's a, it's a clear reference to Bonnard's great series of, of nudes in the bath. Why did you look at Bonnard? What was, what was significant about Bonnard in terms of you, you formulating that painting? I feel like this show in general kind of states my references maybe more clearly. So I feel like the Bonnard, of course, the big landscapes of my siblings, to me, resonates with like monk landscapes. The cypresses kind of bring up Van Gogh. So I, I really wanted kind of like my personal art history to be on the surface in, in this show. Uh, and Bonnard I've been obsessed with for since I was an undergrad. Um, and to me, just like the color, the intimacy, the sense of um, closeness to his figures, uh, to him as a person kind of comes through so strongly in the work and that's something that I really desire in my own work. Is there also something of a challenge in taking on a work like that because it is so I mean apart from anything else they're so strange those nudes in the bath the, the paints the, the, the richness of the colors but also the variety of colors in those Bonnard paintings it's, it's really remarkable so when you're grappling with that is you know, tell me about that experience. Well, it's funny because I feel like this is not the first time that I've kind of quoted Bonnard directly uh, or tried to um, take his palette. And I think what's masterful about him is that he really uses every color in every painting and kind of trying to balance this like rainbow palette is really almost impossible or, what, or kind of what's impossible for me. And I think in this painting, I kind of, the reference is less so in the color palette, I think more like in the in the subject matter or the composition, like it's almost directly relating to kind of the Martha like bath paintings. So I think in this one, I kind of wanted to combine my color sensibility with something that uh, is so clearly his, which is like these bathtub scenes. Uh, one, one of the things I was conscious of when I was looking at that picture was that Bonnard's nudes in the bath, they have that strange combination of like kind of ultimate sensual joy almost in the paint but also this sort of abject quality this very, almost tragic quality because Mark was in the bath a lot she had illnesses and all that sort of thing I'm conscious that I have an emotional reaction built upon what I know about them and of course I suppose whenever you're grappling with art history you are inevitably engaging that in your viewer aren't you yeah, I mean, I think with, with painting, every mark you make, every color combination has a history. Like you're creating these bonds across our history, um, whether you like it or not as a painter. And sometimes they're conscious and you choose them and sometimes they kind of come up from the work and you have to grapple with them. And for me, I feel like the kind of the narrative around um, her condition and what, what you just mentioned, I feel like didn't play as much of a role. I think it's more just my connection to those pieces as being something that I just so immediately identified with when I saw them. Like, I feel like every time I saw Bonnard, again, that kind of, he has an ability to create a world that feels extremely familiar on one hand with a formal structure that is completely non phenomenological So it's not, it's unlike anything that we could see with our eyes, but it um, relates so directly to how we feel things to be. Uh, so that to me is kind of like the, what I took from, from those works. Within the whole idea of, you know, addressing queerness in the work, if you're addressing an art historical past, which is dominated by heterosexual white men, is there a direct idea of queering that history in, in the way in addressing it? Well, I think that to me, what's important is understanding the ways in which heterosexuality is tied to those works, because I think that so much of it is taken for granted. 
Um, and if you think of so many artists, like from Degas, Picasso, Delacroix, Courbet, like Aang, the nature of their desire really dictates a lot of the choices that they make. And I think that kind of realizing that as an artist and thinking about how my desire leads me in different ways and kind of like really insisting on a certain kind of specificity, especially with like more explicit paintings in the show. And also thinking about them as having the power to um, represent and stand for the many things that like straight desire have stood for um, over time. So I think that that's kind of uh, more so than like queering a certain canon. It's more just like understanding how desire in general operates within these paintings that we almost kind of don't see. This episode's about painting, and I wanted to ask you about how you feel about painting, why it is that you are a painter, and why it is you feel that paint is the sort of best vehicle for telling us about your world. I mean, I started painting when I was like six years old, so I feel like it was never kind of an intellectual choice between this or that medium. But I think that when I experienced painting, again, like thinking about someone like Lucian Freud or or Arika, which were very early kind of childhood experience of seeing them, it was such an impactful, powerful experience. Like I immediately knew that that's what I wanted to do. So I think that painting just has such an ability to communicate emotionally and empathically in a way that just resonated with me since I could remember. Um, and I still, you know, have that relationship to painting. Like if standing in front of a Velasquez is, is standing in front of a person, um, it's not standing in front of a painting. And, and I think for an object to be able to do that and kind of communicate the full complexity of what it means to be a person is just infinitely compelling to me. There's a perception that at the moment painting is in a particularly purple patch there, there is a there's an energy about painting at this moment that seems really palpable is that your perception as as a painter and you're in Brooklyn of course yeah I feel like I feel like painting for me has always <laughs> has, has always had that I think that now when I graduated from uh, grad school which was maybe like 10 years ago kind of the dominant mode of working was more related to like process-based abstraction and that has definitely shifted a lot obviously towards towards figuration and a lot of us that are working figuratively uh, we're kind of working in our own little pockets in isolation. And I feel like now there have been so many connections drawn between like the works, uh, like my work and the works of my peers. And I think that to me is, is extremely exciting. But yeah, I feel like as a painter, um, kind of my relationship to painting has always has always been like that. Uh, so it's, it's hard for me to see it from the outside, maybe. Right. Um, in, the, in the show, you've got these, this new body of work of landscapes. Tell us about those. And, and because they relate, on, on the one hand, they relate to your, your childhood, but they also relate to a particularly painful recent event. Absolutely. Um, so I'm originally from Israel, um, and I'm from the north, which is close to the West Bank. And I don't see my work as being political in that sense. But like I was saying with queerness, just describing my experience, like describing, you know, being home after a long period of, of being away. Also, the kind of this body of work started with um, my sister, like right after my sister passed away. So thinking about mourning and grief and loss um, in relationship to this idea of home or this idea of family kind of was the impetus to making these landscapes. But then obviously, as I was making them, the kind of most recent conflict was taking place. So it was almost, I just couldn't ignore what was going on and the relationship to what I'm making at the time. So I think that to me, um, similarly to, again, to thinking about queerness and, and the politics of the work, it's something that I have to spend time thinking about how how it operates within the work and then really make decisions about like what I want to say about it. But I think I don't want to necessarily make claims about what the politics of the work is because I think it's kind of very much things I'm, I'm only starting to think about um, at the moment. But I think everyone around me and um, my family and seeing the images and reading the news, it was just an extremely difficult time. Uh, and what was going on is just unconsciousable. I wanted to ask about the balance between the kind of um, remembered image and the image as you see it, because both in terms of the figurative work and the landscapes, they're based upon observed reality, right? But they're also deeply enmeshed in the sort of subjective memory. Can you say something about that to and fro in the work? Totally. I, so working for observation actually is very much at the core of my practice. And I think that for me, it's less so about this like painterly being a painter, like a purist in, in sorts. Like I, I use 
photographs and um, really whatever works. But this one-to-one encounter with another person and, and being able to gauge literally every gesture that I make to the person in front of me and whether it resonates with my experience of them. So that's something that, for example, I wouldn't be able to do if I wouldn't know the person. So that's why like my familiarity with the subject is so important. Um, and I feel like sometimes with images of my husband, for example, I don't even need him to be there. Like even just looking at like a blurry photograph or whatever is enough because he's, the image of him is so embedded in my mind. So it's interesting. It's interesting. Like if I'm painting my mom, it could take like 20 minutes and it would, it would look and feel exactly like her. Where if it's like a friend or someone, and someone that I'm not as close with, it would be more of kind of like this observational process where I'm really kind of like seeking information from the visual experience. So I feel like it, this connection to, to the world really gauges my relationship also to the person. Duran, thank you so much. Thank you. Deron Langberg, Give Me Love, is at Victoria Miro in London until the 6th of November. His works can also be seen in any distance between us at the RISD Museum, Providence in Rhode Island, until the 13th of March next year. And he'll also feature in A Place for Me, Figurative Painting Now, which is at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, opening in March next year. Now, painting may be a dynamic, critical space, but it also remains the medium most beloved of collectors. But what are those people that buy art looking for in a painting? Can it be both radical and saleable? I spoke to Lisa Schiff, who in 2002 founded SFA Advisory, which specialises in advising collectors on modern and contemporary art. Lisa, I wanted to begin by asking, at the moment the Hayward has this exhibition, the contention of Ralph Rugoff, the the uh, director of the Hayward is that painting is in a, in a particular purple patch that it's a very strong moment for painting does that mean that collectors are responding in the same way if say the Hayward says painting's really strong at the moment will collectors respond to that I suppose so but I don't know that I agree with that necessarily I don't think you know painting's ever not been in a purple patch but I think what is maybe more popular today is non-conceptual painting, very tactile, painterly painting, very beautiful and pleasing painting. Craft-like is very much sought after right now, which kind of emphasizes the painting aspect of it. We've had other phases where paintings actually mimicked photography, um, and that's very much not in vogue right now. One thinks when you say that of the kind of high figures that Gerhard Richter paintings were achieving at at auction and things like that. So you're saying in a sense there's been a sort of step away from that amongst collectors. By photographic, it's not so much the Richter style of painting. It's more the Christopher Wool or Andy Warhol or Wade Guyton kind of, you know, more the technological hand. I think Richter's still very painterly and sort of hasn't gone out of vogue in that sense. That's interesting. Are there moments where, you know, you see the rise in the market of a particular painter? I'm thinking of those artists that became known as zombie formalists not too long ago. And is that difficult to manage from an art advisor's point of view? Do, do, those, do those artists become in demand for the collectors that you work with? And do you have to sort of manage that sort of uh, process to a certain extent? You know, funny enough, zombie formalism, the artists that were sort of ascribed to that were n- never anything that I purchased or recommended or would even allow. They were so clearly in a particular space of speculation. So I wouldn't call out the rise of a certain artist. I could talk about the rise of Christopher Wool or Wade Guyton or Andy Warhol, but I really wouldn't talk about the rise of zombie formalism unless you're thinking of it in a wider reaching sense. No, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in the fact that you would choose not to urge those that people that you work with not to buy those works. And it was, was, was it because you could see this sort of bubble of speculation building and you were just steer clear or just, be, or actually were you making a set it judgment there? This is not good mm, work. It just felt like it was made for market, just like much of the very craft, like beautiful painting today feels, a lot of it feels made for market. And it usually is pretty obvious when that's happening. And so 
I'll just sort of step away. Sometimes if it's not clear, I'll step away and just pause. If something gets too hyped, there's no point to like get involved. It really, it just gets too murky in terms of what's really going on because it just goes up so fast, right? So usually I'll just step away. My clients don't actually ever ask me to chase specific names like that. And any who's come along to work with me who has, I stay away from because I have been doing this long enough. I know where that's headed. Um, and it's just not interesting. It's really not interesting at all. So do you see one of your roles then as being in a way trying to predict where the sort of new artists are emerging from? And, and obviously it's within the field of painting, this is particularly important. I kind of look at it more like figuring out the historical zeitgeist of a moment and like as it's being reflected both in artworks being produced but also in shows being curated you know there's usually something in the air and there's been something in the air for a bit now and yes there's definitely we have had a shift towards figurative painting but more interesting than that is sort of an interest in beauty and and landscape and still lives and also a heavy sense of craft you know the ability to paint not a factory painter and that's kind of interesting like why is that happening you know what's pushing us in that direction a lot of it comes off as slightly transcendental also and i think it's probably a lot of the trauma of life and the existential trauma so there's not this desire so much to look at a political painting. I would also say, more interestingly, another zeitgeist is there seems to be no avant-garde. There seems to be no desire to undermine the status quo, but rather to beat the status quo at its own game. And so, you know, that's also very interesting. One of the things that Again, there's the contention of, of Ralph Rugoff, who's put together this show, is that the, is that the artists are dealing with um, potential global issues with a sort of level of ambiguity. Um, and it seems to be uh, that, that, in a way, it's a complicated relationship with image and with, and with issues rather than a sort of, um, rather than the kind of tweet 280 character takes on, on issues. Is that your perception in terms of the paintings that you're looking at, this this nuanced look at the world around them. Yeah, and actually, I don't know a lot about the show that he's put together, and I'm really curious to see it now because that might be the best form the avant-garde, if there is one, can take right now, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm very curious to to kind of look at that. And yeah, definitely there's a sense of, ambiguity in the air in terms of like dealing head on with events or things happening in the world that are complicated i mean one of the things that i'm conscious of is that is that there's a lot that within these artists it may be veiled in some ways but there is a lot of dealing with for instance identity displacement migration lots of global issues which actually are quite you know are very of this moment and are are grappling with difficult themes in your experience would collectors be put off collecting a painting if it dealt with issues in that way do collectors steer clear of overtly political work no i don't think so it depends on the collector and it depends on the particular goal of of a particular purchase you know there's always actually filling your walls, which does involve some degree of decorating. It has to. But then there's like building out your collection and finding a spot for something. And that's usually when something like that might come in, depending on how ambitious the collector might be. But I would say most of my clients veer towards more subtle interaction. I mean, it's like even looking at someone like Glenn Ligon, who you could argue has been dealing with identity politics very literally because he mostly quotes James Baldwin, like text. But it's sort of hard to get to the text, right? The text is usually murky and it's hard to penetrate it. And so it's like allows you to have something 
like this in your home and to sit and think about it. I think the kind of in your face political stuff oftentimes would be pointing back at the 1%. And um, there's a certain degree of hypocrisy in hanging something on your wall that you're actually contributing to. I'm not saying that appeals to any of my clients whatsoever, but I do find it we're in a very complicated time. You know, I worked on climate change issues for a long time and it was amazing how few people want to talk about it because the overwhelming fact is until consumers of all levels are offered an alternative, they're just going to keep flying on private jets and buying plastic. And, and so it becomes like you feel guilty. And so to have a lot of this identity issues and particularly around black lives matter, like, I think it's easier for, at least for me, to work on it in a way that doesn't feel hypocritical, right? You know, like if I'm realizing I've been part of the problem and I didn't didn't take enough responsibility and I have to work on it, it's a little bit easier to to live with something kind of timeless. That's something I aspire to with all art anyways. And Glenn Ligon for me is timeless. And he tapped something in such a way, I, I have many other examples, Mark Bradford. It's the same conversation, but it's it's not like, by the way, you suck, you know, <laughs> thank you, buyer, you suck and you're a bad person. And, you know, it's more like there's some hope involved in the beauty of the aesthetics. And there's a little just way to, to kind of break in with agency and try to kind of needle somebody into actually thinking about something that is much more effective in the long run than something kind of more over. That's just my personal opinion. Sorry. I'm probably like, you know, there's a lot to say. It's just for home collections. I don't necessarily think certain things are appropriate for that setting, but certain things are. And I kind of, especially when people are unaware and I remember putting a um, very feminist Andrea Bowers into a very male dominated benefit auction and it did very well. And I just got such a chuckle out of it because I'm not sure anyone quite realized how feminist it was. But if what, if you sit with it long enough, you'll get it. <laughs> That's the thing, isn't it? I mean, you know, obviously a private collector, not all of them, some of them store their works in free ports, but many private collectors live with the works that they buy and it, and it, therefore you know another thing that that a lot of people have been talking about is slow looking in a digital world slow looking is one of the aspects of painting that makes it most distinct and i suppose that it, the, the slowest form of looking is living with a painting and and living with it every day and looking at it every day and getting something from it every day right yeah definitely so you know is that one of the aims in a way of collecting you know they want you to find things for them that they can live with and they know that they're going to live with for a long time most of my clients function that way, but then you get like bigger collectors who are more ambitious and actually we have to be really grateful for them because they often will buy things well beyond the scope of their walls. And, you know, the goal there is then to try to work hard on getting long-term loans just so not, not, not to boost the value, but just to like put it out there in the world. So it's not sitting in storage a lot of the great artworks in the past 50 years have been enormous in scale. So that's one thing. And sometimes they're just not potentially domestic in their uh, subject matter, let's say. I know that you visit art schools and obviously painting is certainly very alive in British art schools right now. I'm interested in to what extent collectors are prepared to take risks on artists that young or that fresh out of college will collectors take a risk on those kind of artists i mean it certainly seems like it you know as an advisor you don't have like hundreds of clients you've like a handful so i can only speak to like my people but it certainly seems like this summer every primary market show of painting was sold out 10 times over. And I'm just thinking, who is buying all this stuff? But I'm happy they are. I just don't know who it is. You know, it just seems like before it's even exhibited, it's gone. Um, so I do think there's like a little bit of a interesting kind of craze right now for painting and figurative painting in particular. But, you know, let's, let's see what happens in time. I do think there's a lot of speculation 
going on. There's sort of a shift in value making and Instagram and, you know, sort of a fan based economy, things that are kind of going to affect how we buy right now. But I still look at the old values of the sort of, or the old metrics of value making, which are not always crystal clear, but that's what leads me to get behind an artist. So if it's a young artist and I just like it, you know, then we'll look at it. But usually we try to make sure there's some hint of historical relevancy that it is aesthetically compelling or conceptually compelling and that it is strategically placed. So um, I can't do, I can do some of the job of pushing an artist along, but not much. A gallery really does that job. So I want to know, like, if it's a young artist, I don't necessarily want to be buying from the studio. I want to be buying from a young gallery who I know is hungry and is working really hard for their artists. We've actually heard a lot about people buying direct from Instagram, buying paintings directly from Instagram. How much is that a phenomenon? Well, I find Instagram actually, I hate to admit how great I find it working. I really like, don't want it to work, but it really does work because I don't know, it's because it's so visual. Like for me, it's not so much buying directly. I know lots of artists who get DM'd all day long by collectors from all over the world to buy a painting directly, regardless of a gallery or whatever. And I'm sure sometimes they say yes, but I don't really do that. I might direct message someone for a studio visit if I don't know how to get to them else elsewise. But I think it's just been really helpful for searching. I like curated a show this summer and it was really fun to search through Instagram according to like a theme I was looking for. Um, and it was fun to find artists that don't function necessarily in this art world and to kind of like mix it up a little bit. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And now it's time for this episode's Work of the Week. If you're a regular listener to The Week in Art, you may remember a couple of years ago that we interviewed Uta Neidhart, a senior conservator at the Gemälde Gallery Alta Meister in Dresden, who had made a startling discovery about Johannes Vermeer's girl reading a letter at an open window. She'd unveiled that a painting of Cupid discovered behind a painted wall in an X-ray decades ago, but long thought to have been painted out of the picture by Vermeer himself, was in fact painted over by someone else. She's now finished restoring the work and it will go on view from today in Johannes Vermeer on Reflection, an exhibition at the Gemälde Gallery. I spoke to Uta to catch up with her, now the work's complete, but also to discuss some intriguing new findings. Uta, I last spoke to you just after you'd announced that you discovered that the Vermeer Cupid was meant to be left in the painting by Vermeer. Tell us what it's like now that you've made the restoration and it's gleamingly bright and the colours look beautiful. Tell me your feelings now that you've finished it. After four years of restoration, it's a wonderful feeling and it's quite wonderful to see this painting. It's so uh, beautiful. The colours are stronger than ever before. It's sparkling. It has so much light. You can feel the different... um, in the in this room in his space which he created for the girl it's unbelievable and it's a wonderful feeling to have the painting again how Vermeer intended to do that indeed it is tell us again exactly how you knew that it was Vermeer's intention to have the cupid in the painting and that he didn't overpaint it when the restorer started to restore this painting he uh, removed the varnish And in doing this, he mentioned that there was a difference um, in the behavior of the paint layer by Vermeer and the paint layer uh, where the overpaint was on the surface of the painting. So he was very curious about that. And then we started to do some natural sciences research. And by the help of checking some paint samples under the microscope, we found that there was a paint layer 
And then came a varnish that was probably Vermeer's varnish, then a layer of dirt, then a next varnish, and at the end, the overpaint layer. And then we knew that there was a thick layer of a sandwich in between. And that uh, was exposed to the, the air. And that this, this dirt in between t told us that there was some time in between, between the original uh, paint layer and the overpaint layer. I, ra I rather love that, that one of the most beautiful and luminous paintings in history was unveiled in its full sense because there was dirt on its surface. <laughs> and it's, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a lovely irony. Yeah, yeah. Now, when you first revealed the picture of the restored painting, when we looked at it at the art newspaper, we, it, because, you, because there's a border around the edge and in the very bottom right of the picture, there's this curious object what is that curious object? This object is uh, not to be seen today. It's covered. In, this object was a glass, a rumor glass. And in an earlier version of this whole composition, Vermeer intended to have this glass in front of the whole scene as a kind of a repoussoir. But in a later state of the composition, he decided to overpaint it and to cover it by a green curtain. And then he decided to have the green curtain and the painting of the Cupid on the wall. He did the decision together. So the Cupid is also covered by the green curtain, but it's, it doesn't go in un underneath the green curtain. So he decided for this solution at the same time. So in other words, it's very clear that Vermeer rejected this idea to have this rumor glass actually in his composition, but, but it would have been very dominant, wouldn't it? It would have been quite big at the front of the picture. Yes, indeed. The glass would have been very big. It, it wouldn't belong to the interior. It would have been outside, in our sphere, in the sphere of the visitor, a, a little bit similar to the green curtain. Right, so it's almost like a, an illusion device. In, in other words, it's so that the, the painting became a kind of window into this woman's world and there was a glass sort of sitting on the edge of the frame. Yes, exactly. That was his first intention. And he also tried another version, which we already found out in 2010. He tried to have a second Spanish chair in the very front of the painting and we found the traces of a lion's head. These heads were typical for these Spanish chairs. and uh, But later he also covered this lion's head, which was quite big in the foreground. He covered it by the pattern of the curtain or, or the, the tapestry there. And one of the things obviously about this picture is that is that we have grown, many of us who've grown up looking at Vermeer, have had, had a particular attachment to the sort of sparseness of that picture. And it's, it's curious in a way that we have to kind of relearn the picture is that is that why you're calling it a new Vermeer? Yes, exactly. You know, this painting is in Dresden already 250 years, and the public loves it, or they loved it in in its old version. They loved this grayish, empty wall in the background and the girl in profile before this empty wall. It was kind of a, a modern seeing on this painting, but now we change it totally. And it's also a bit difficult for the visitors to accept that change. That is, that is an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? Because I guess we just became so attached to it as it was. But at the same time, one of the things that really strikes me is that in the restoration, you've really unveiled this picture as a painting in which the colours really sing, don't they? I mean, the, the, the curtain itself that you've talked about, it, there's an almost golden sheen to it, isn't there? Yes, indeed. The, the curtain became more voluminous. Now you have the impression that you can touch it and you can remove it and you can take it away from the whole painting, what's indeed not possible, but you get this haptic uh, illusion. It's much stronger than before. So this show now, as you say, you, you've, you've got uh, 10 Vermeers in this exhibition, um, which is, it doesn't sound like many, but given how beloved these works are in, in the collections that they're in around the world. That's, some, that's quite something to, to do this. So what are you arguing about, about Vermeer in this exhibition? Are there new arguments or is it really just an opportunity to see him in, in, in greater depth than you might otherwise do? Yes, of course. There were some of these Vermeer paintings which we had to have 
So we started to ask for this, especially the girl reading a letter in blue from Amsterdam. And of course, the lady standing at the Virgin from London with the Cupid in the background. And also, we wanted to have some paintings from this early period of his career around the end of the 1650s, beginning of the 1660s. So we framed this early painting from Dresden by some paintings which are very close to this one. So it was uh, one of our missions to have all these paintings, these 10 pieces together, to let the people see much more uh, how our restored Vermeer uh, fits into this series of paintings, which he did almost at the same time. And otherwise, how wonderful it fits to the, the uh, later girls playing at the Virginals because of the Cupid on the wall. So there are so many different options we had to, yeah, to clarify. To, and, and we offer this to our visitors. Uta, thank you very much for joining us. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Johannes Vermeer on Reflection is at the Gemälde Galleria in Dresden until the 2nd of January next year. And that's all for this episode. You can subscribe to the art newspaper at theartnewspaper.com, click on the subscribe link at the top left of the page and you'll find a range of subscriptions. And do subscribe to this podcast and a brush with if you haven't already done so. Please give us a rating or review if you enjoyed it. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julia Mahalska, Amy Dawson and David Clack. And David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks also to Henrietta Bentel and Danielle Hathaway and to this week's guests, Deron, Mohammed, Vivian, Lisa and Uta. And thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.